Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is Promote the Vote, Voting Rights and Accessibility Standards. And we'll go ahead and get started. As a quick reminder, today's webinar will be recorded and is available for viewing on pba.org. Closed captioning is available. Go ahead and click the CC button in the meetings control bar at the bottom of your screen to turn it on. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. Questions will be answered at the end of the program. All right, and today is my pleasure to introduce you to Antonia James. She is our newest uh, member of the government relations team. Antonia is a native of DC. She earned her undergraduate degree from UCLA and a law degree from the University of California, Irvine School of Law, where she was drawn to public interest and advocacy. Antonia's areas of focus are in disability advocacy, including voting, social security, housing, long-term services, and support. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Antonia. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Antonia James, and I am so excited um, to be with you all today and share this presentation um, and information um, about voting. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, so uh, we have the agenda and today we will be speaking about um, some the people with disabilities and voting. Um, we will also discuss federal laws protecting the rights of voters with disabilities. Um, and then after we will speak about the voting process where we will tie in um, how those federal laws um, are actively protecting the rights of voter disabilities and how it shows up in the voting process. Um, next, we will talk about filing disability related complaints um, when you or if you run into issues um, when voting. Um, we will also discuss some resources and have a Q&A. Um, that will be moderated by Lisa. Um, awesome. So next slide. So in the November 2020 election, um, individuals with disabilities voted at a 7% lower weight rate than people without disabilities. Um, more than 11% of people with disabilities um, reported that they face difficulties when voting, and 11 may 11 percent may sound um, like a small number, but um, it's important to keep in mind that is two million people um, at least that reported that they had issues and difficulties when voting. Um, voters with disabilities um, often face a range of barriers. Um, including inaccessible voting places, lack of accessible voting machines, and um, state laws that restrict voting by mail um, or criminalize assisting a person in voting. Um, when the um, Government Accountability Office visited um, 167 voting places during the 2016 general election, only 17% um, of those voting places were fully accessible for people with disabilities who wanted to vote in person. Um, the most common barriers um, that are faced are usually steep ramps, um, lack of signs for accessible paths um, to the buildings where the voting is taking place, um, and gravel parking lots or a lack of parking options. Um, because these barriers, um, because of these barriers, people with disabilities are less likely to vote than people without disabilities, despite having an equal right to participate in the democratic process. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Great. So now we will be discussing um, the federal laws protecting the rights of voters with disabilities. Um, these are important federal civil rights laws um, that were enacted to combat um, different forms of discrimination and protect the fundamental right to vote. 
for people with disabilities. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, okay, so um, this is just an overview um, of the federal laws um, protecting the rights of voters with disabilities. Um, we have the Voting Rights Act of 1965 or the VRA. Um, the VRA requires election officials to allow a voter who is um, blind or has another disability to receive assistance from a person of the voter's choice. Um, it has to be someone other than the voter's employer um, or its agent um, or an officer or agent of the voter's union. Um, I will expand deeper on the following um, uh, federal laws in the upcoming slides. So um, we also have the Americans with Disability Act, the ADA, the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, the NVRA, and the Voting Accessibility for the Elderly and Handicapped Act of 1984, the VAEHA, a lot of acronyms, um, and the Help America Vote Act of 2002, or HAVA. So we can move on. Next slide, please. So the Americans with Disabilities Act for some background, the ADA was passed on July 26, 1990. It is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. Um, the ADA is divided into five titles um, or sections that relate to um, different areas. So the sections cover employment, state and local governments, public accommodations, um, and telecommunications. This specific presentation will cover how the ADA protects individuals with disabilities and the requirements under Title II of the ADA during the voting process. Next slide, please. So getting into Title II of the ADA. Um, this title requires state and local governments um, or public ent entities to ensure that people with disabilities have a full and equal opportunity to vote. Um, the ADA's provisions apply to all aspects of voting, um, including voter registration, site selection, casting of the ballots, um, whether on election day or during an early voting process. So it encapsulates all that. Um, we will discuss some voting specific provisions of the ADA um, later in the presentation. Uh, so we'll get to that. Next slide. So um, the National Voter Registration Act of 1998 or the um, NVRA, so the NVRA mandates that participating states provide voter registration options um, at offices that offer services to individuals, including those with disabilities. Um, so it requires that offices um, that provide public assistance like SNAP, um, WIC, TANF, um, or state funded programs like Offices providing vocational um, rehabilitation, transportation, job training, education counseling, rehabilitation, um, or independent living services um, for people with disabilities to provide the opportunity to register to vote in federal elections. Um, so the NVRA applies to 44 states and the District of Columbia. The exempted states are uh, Idaho, Minnesota, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Wisconsin, and Wyoming. Um, Puerto Rico is also exempted from the NVRA. Um, and while the NVRA applies to elections in federal offices or, or in federal office, um, states have extended the participating states have extended its procedures to all elections. Next, oh, sorry. 
um, and enforcement. So the Department of Justice um, can bring civil actions in federal court to enforce the requirements of the NVRA. Next slide. So um, the NVRA in, back, in action at the VA. So on March 10th, 2021, um, the president signed an executive order, 14019, um, <laughs> directing federal agencies to take steps, um, making voter registration more accessible. Um, the VA unveiled a series of measures promoting greater access to voter information um, for veterans and their families as part of the department's proposed designation as a voter registration agency under the NVRA. So um, right now, uh, the VA announced that for their um, pilot, pilot there will pilot registration um, sites, um, there will be three Michigan VA locations um, that will serve as the pilot registration sites. And they are the Saginaw um, VA Medical Center, um, the Detroit VA Medical Center, and the Detroit Regional Office. Um, this agreement will empower um, the VA to provide voter registration information and assistance to veterans and eligible dependents at those three facilities. Um, so, you know, this is just the pilot program right now in those three locations, but, you know, hopefully as it expands, um, there will be locations everywhere. Um, next slide. So uh, for the voting accessibility for the uh, Elderly and Handicapped Act, excuse me, or the VAHHA, so um, there's actually a bill that's been introduced that would change the name of this law um, and rename it to the Voting Accessibility for Individuals with Disabilities and Older Individuals. Um, I will speak more about this law um, or more about this bill later in the presentation. Um, you know, just wanted to get that out now because obviously the name of um, the law, you know, could be very shocking. So, um, so the VA each VA -E -H -A, um, generally requires polling places across the the, the U.S. Um, to be physically accessible to people with disabilities for federal elections. Um, where there is no accessible location, um, where no accessible location is available um, to serve as a polling place, a political subdivision, um, they have to provide an alternative means of casting a ballot on the day of election. Um, so that um, people with disabilities are able to um, participate. So in terms of enforcement, um, once again, just like um, with the VRA, um, the DOJ can bring civil actions in federal court to enforce the requirements of the VAEHA. Next slide, please. And next, we have um, the Help America Vote Act of 2002. I know there are a lot of acronyms, but this is just HAVA, uh, not the uh, H-A-V-A. -A. Um, okay, so HAVA creates um, mandatory minimum standards for states to follow if, um, in several key areas of election administration, including accessible voting systems, accessible voting machines and voter databases. <clears throat> oh, did I get some water really quickly, sorry. Thank you. So HAVA also established the Election Assistance Commission, um, also known as the EAC, to assist the states um, regarding HAVA compliance and to also distribute HAVA funds to states as well. 
So in terms of enforcement, the DOJ has enforced HAVA through both litigation um, and by informing jurisdictions of the department's views on the act's requirements. Next slide. All right, um, now we are going to discuss the voting process. We are going to get into everything um, from voter registration to voter ID laws, um, you know, and all that good stuff. Uh, we go to the next slide. All right, for a voter registration, <clears throat> according to findings uh, from a recent EAC Rutgers study, people with disabilities um, are more likely to vote in person, um, usually at town halls, registration offices, um, public assistance agencies, polling places, and registration drives. Um, as I mentioned before, the NVRA um, requires all offices that provide public assistance or state funded programs um, that primarily serve people with disabilities to provide opportunities to register to vote. Um, by, usually by providing voter registration forms, assisting voters in completing the forms, and transmitting um, completed forms to the appropriate election officials. Um, some of these um, offices would be like DMVs um, or campuses of state funded colleges. Um, so just to you know, clarify and emphasize, um, they are offering, uh, they offer the opportunity to register to vote and assistance as well. So it shouldn't just be, you know, you're getting handed all these documents and then it's like, you know, bye, see you later. Um, you should also have assistance. <clears throat> if you um, experience a, a violation, um, you can report it. Um, you can contact the um, voting section um, of the Civil Rights Division of the DOJ. Um, their number is listed below um, on this slide. It is 1-800-253-3931. Um, um, or you can uh, email them at voting.section at usdoj.gov. Next slide. <clears throat> So absentee voting. Um, so similar to uh, voter registration, each state has its own set of deadlines and rules for absentee voting. Um, all US states um, and Washington DC and Puerto Rico um, permit people with a disability to vote absentee, um, allowing you to mail in your ballot or drop it off at a drop box or polling location. Um, when you have a disability, uh, there are special circumstances that entitle you to use mail-in, absentee, or other forms of remote voting. Um, in some states, you do have to apply for these options each year. Um, and in other states, you can um, get on a permanent list for each election. Um, but it's very important um, to know, um, do your research on what your specific state allows. Um, some states require you to complete an application in order to receive an absentee ballot, um, and their deadlines to apply vary. Um, some could be um, as early as weeks, a couple weeks before the election. If the last time you voted um, was in the last major election, um, this is just a reminder that election, you know, was in 2020 during a pandemic. Um, so things may look um, differently um, depending on which state you are in. Um, you know, there was a lot more leniency when it came to absentee absentee voting uh voting because of the pandemic so um now things may look um completely differently and it could be harder um to vote in your state um absentee um 
this could just not be in your state. Uh, even if you moved in a different state, um, you know, they could have completely different rules um, about absentee voting. Um, so it is very, very important to be proactive and check out um, the laws of your state um, and to get more information, um, especially as early as possible. That would be my biggest recommendation. Um, you can check out the deadlines um, for your specific state um, at vote.org. Um, the link is in the PowerPoint. And just a reminder, um, the PowerPoint will be available with the links included um, after the presentation. Um, next slide. So uh, absentee voting in the news. In 2023, at least 14 states enacted 17 uh, restrictive voting laws that will take effect in the 2024 um, general election. So like I said previously, you know, um, voting laws in different states have changed um, since 2020. So it is very important um, to be aware of those. Um, there is, uh, there will be a, a link provided later in the presentation for um, the specific uh, 14 states and 17 restrictive voting laws. Um, so that will be available to you. Um, most of the laws um, that have been enacted, they limit mail-in voting, um, they shorten the window of requesting a mail ballot, or they ban drop boxes like as a whole in that state. Um, there have also been lawsuits um, to ban or restrict uh, no excuse mail-in voting. Um, recently, for example, um, the Delaware Superior Court role, ruled that Delaware's early voting and um, permanent absentee voting statutes violated their state's constitution. Um, however, uh, the Delaware Attorney General did state that um, this ruling won't affect the uh, April 2nd presidential primary. Um, so even though these laws aren't specifically targeted at people with disabilities, they do create um, additional barriers for them. And um, to speak further into that, in Arizona federal court, um, there are two uh, voter suppression laws that would purge um, voters from the state's permanent mail-in voting rolls and restrict voters' ability to uh, fix small technical errors in their mail-in ballots. Um, so that's just some of the things that are currently going on. Um, you know, further emphasizing my point that is very important to be aware of what your state's current um, laws, laws regarding voting are to be prepared. Next slide. Okay, so um, for voter ID laws. So um, as of January of this year, um, 34 states uh, require voters to present I, uh, identification in order to vote at the polls on election day. Um, of these states, um, 23 require voters to present identification containing a photograph. Um, 11 uh, states accepted other forms of identification, and the remaining 16 states uh, did not require voters to present identification in order to vote at the polls on election day. Um, so it's very important um, to know what your state's specific voter ID laws are, um, what you can and can't bring, whether or not, you know, uh, an ID is okay if you can bring your passport. I know there have been um, questions about different forms of identification. Um, so it's very important because the states vary to check what your specific state um, does and, or does not allow. Um, disabled uh, voters are exempt from federal first time voter ID requirements. 
um, but might not be exempt from state voter ID laws. Um, in certain states that require voters to provide identification, there may be exceptions uh, that allow some voters to um, cast a, a ballot without providing an ID. Um, but once again, um, it is important to you know check that out beforehand. Um, to view the voter ID laws uh, by state, um, we do have a link to vote.org um, that will be available after presentation. Next slide. Uh, now we will move on to in-person voting. Um, Title II of the ADA requires um, that public entities ensure that people with disabilities um, can access and use all of their voting facilities. Um, these public entities um, may ensure that on election day, um, accessibility of a polling place um, by low cost temporary measures, um, such as you know, a portable ramp um, or door stops, they don't necessarily have to make these permanent modifications to the facilities, um, but the temporary measures should allow um, for accessibility. Um, if the temporary measures uh, won't fix uh, the barrier um, and the public entities are unable to make a permanent modification um, to the building that would fix the barrier, then they have to look for, and um, the public entity um, has to look for an alternative accessible polling place. Um, next slide. So with accessible voting systems and um, effective communication, um, Hava speaks to this in terms of um, federal elections um, and they require jurisdictions um, to have a voting system that is accessible. Um, the voting system has to provide the same opportunity for access and participation, um, including privacy and independence um, that voters without disabilities um, can partake in. Um, <clears throat> so when voting at the polls, um, a person with a disability has the right to vote privately um, and independently and have an accessible polling, polling place with at least one accessible voting machine. Um, and to ensure that these accommodations are met, um, voters with disabilities um, may either um, seek assistance from the poll workers who should be trained um, in using the accessible voting machines, um, or they're also allowed to bring someone with them uh, to help vote. Um, the ADA also requires election officials um, conducting any elections at the federal, state, or local level um, to provide communication with voters with disabilities. Um, that is as effective as the communication um, given to voters without disabilities. So this would look like a, um, websites on voting or on um, elections. They have to be accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and that's very important because that's where most of the time or they're learning the information about the election and about voting. So it should be accessible. Um, next slide. So um, in these next in these next few slides, the information um, is going to um, get you know pretty technical. So I just wanted to give a reminder that these slides will be posted um, and available on the PVA website after the presentation. Um, so don't feel worried about you know not being able to jot every day, everything down. Um, so I hope that, you know, relieves any stress anyone was feeling. Um, so next we are going to talk about parking. 
So um, if parking is provided for voters, um, accessible parking um, must be provider, provided for people with disabilities. Um, and there are three uh, features that make an um, accessible space, um, an accessible parking space, an access aisle, um, and uh, the signage designating it as an accessible parking space. Um, so the ADA has um, certain provisions um, on the amount of par accessible parking spaces that need to be available, um, depending on um, the overall like number of parking spaces. Um, and also the um, amount of parking spaces that need to be accessible um, for a van. Um, and that is one of six accessible parking places must be van accessible. Um, they also have the provisions for um, the length and width of the access aisles. Um, and that information is here as well. Um, once again, these slides will be provided. Um, yes. So they also um, have rules pertaining to uh, the signage. Um, of the international symbol for accessibility and where it can be, um, how it must be presented and where it must be showing. Um, it must mark um, each accessible parking place. Um, and the accessible parking spaces and the access aisles serving them must be on a surface that is stable, firm, and slip resistant. We can go to the next slide. Excuse me. So next we have the uh, passenger drop off um, and passenger loading zone locations. Um, if the polling place um, is served by a passenger drop off area, then at least one of the drop off area um, areas must be accessible. Um, there must be level an, a level access aisle um, next to um, each vehicle space, next to the uh, vehicle space. And if a curb separates the access aisle from an accessible route, um, a curb ramp must be provided so that people with disabilities can get to the accessible route leading to the accessible entrance. So if in a situation um, the curb is separate and a ramp um, is not available, um, that is something to, you know, like keep a lookout for. Um, and if so, you know, like ask, um, if possible, ask someone there or um, later down the line, if that is, you know, an issue, um, report it as well. So that would be something that would be um, reported because you must have the curb ramp. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of accessible routes, um, there must be an accessible route from the accessible parking. The accessible route actually starts at the accessible parking. So from the parking, or the um, drop off sites, uh, the sideways and walkways um, and public transportation stops to get to the entrance of the voting facility. Um, the ADA has uh, the provisions on the length and width um, of the accessible routes. Um, and whenever possible, the accessible route must be the same as or near the general circulation path. Um, inside of the polling place, there must be an accessible route as well. Um, that accessible route must be uh, from the entrance 
through the hallways, corridors, um, and interior rooms leading to the voting area. So all that is considered an, a route that must be accessible. Um, the route must be free from abrupt changes in level, um, steps, high thresholds, um, or steeply sloped walkways. So it should be, you know, without difficulty for someone using um, a mobility device to access um, or go along the route. Um, where the route is different um, in the general circulation path, there must be um, signs that will um, direct the voters with disabilities um, to the accessible routes and to the voting area. Next. Um, also, there are provisions in, regarding ramps. Um, if any part of the accessible route, the exterior or the interior um, has um, a slope greater than one in 20, um, it is considered a ramp and must meet the requirements for ramps. Um, whether these ramps are um, inside or outside, um, they can't be too steep. Um, they, the landing under the ramp um, or the level under the ramp must be um, stable. Um, there must be a level landing at the bottom and the top and where the ramp changes direction. Um, they must meet the ADA requirements um, regarding the slope with landings, handrails, and edge protection. Um, and if any part of an accessible route contains a, stamp, a steps, even if, it's, even if it's just one step, there has to be um, a ramp. In the past, at some polling places where um, you know, one or more steps uh, were present, um, some officials um, or other voters have carried people um, using mo mobility devices up the steps. Um, this practice is extremely dangerous um, and should not be done at all um, for the person carrying and for the person being carried. Um, it can also be, you know, like very um, degrading. So even if it's just one step, there needs to be a ramp. Um, next slide. Um, so there are also provisions on the uh, building entrances. Um, a polling place must have at least one accessible entrance. Um, at least one door at the accessible entrance um, must have a minimum clear width of 32 inches um, for a voter using a mobility device. Um, and also the accessible entrance um, shouldn't be blocked um, and it must remain unlocked at all times that the polling place is open. Um, next slide, Pete, please. Um, let's see. So for in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get too um, into depth about the um, specific provisions um, for the, um, you know, certain things like the lifts and elevators, um, but just to um, quickly touch on it, um, if the voting area is not, this, not on the same level as the entrance, um, then there must be an independently uh, operable elevator or lift. Um, um, the door to the elevator or lift um, and the space within must be wide enough to accommodate, accommodate for mobility devices. Um, all the controls must be operable um without um for people that have um uh, dexterity um uh disabilities um and uh the chairs or the lifted seats have to comply with the 2010 um ADA standards um next slide please 
Um, now we get to the actual voting area. Um, the accessible voting area must have an accessible entrance. Um, there are provisions on um, the voting machines and how tall they can be. Um, and if a voter is expected to vote um, at counters or tables, there should be a writing surface that provides um, clearance in terms of the knees and toes um, so that a voter using a mobility device um, may sit and use the counter or table. Next slide. Um, okay, so in terms of temporary remedies, um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, buildings don't have to, you know, make uh, permanent modifications um, to be accessible if they are, you know, being used as a polling place. Um, many of the accessibility barriers at the polling places can be removed with temporary remedies. Um, they aren't designed to be permanent solutions, um, but for example, that could look like, um, you know, the placard for the accessible parking, um, they could use a traffic cone and, you know, put the placard on top of that and put it in the spots, um, portable ramps, um, door wedges, and then also, you know, removing posts that can be um, removed. Next slide. Um, for ballot drop boxes, um, the ADA requires that they are accessible to people with disabilities. Um, that includes an accessible route to the ballot drop box, um, an accessible clear floor um, or ground space in front of the ballot drop box, and an accessible ballot box drop box opening. Not all states um, use ballot drop boxes, so this will pertain to the states uh, that do. Um, next slide. And in these next few so slides, they just go um, further into um, what the accessible route, um, the provisions, uh, specific uh, detailed <laughs> provisions for the accessible route. Um, you did next slide the accessible clear floor and ground space. Um, and next slide. And the accessible opening. Um, what uh, the provisions for all of those. Um, so sorry to move through it too fast, but in the interest of time. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yes, so um, Public entities, uh, the state and local governments uh, need to make reasonable, reasonable modifications um, when necessary to allow people with disabilities to cast their ballots. So this could look like um, if a, a polling place is located um, where animals are not allowed, um, a reasonable modification would be for someone with a, dis with a disability to be able to bring their service animals. Um, transportation to the polling place um, and curbside voting as well. Um, next slide. Thank you. So um, with curbside voting, it allows voters with disabilities um, to request a, a ballot um, be brought out of the polling, polling place to the accessible location, um, such as a vehicle. Um, typically, the election workers will bring uh, the voting materials um, out to uh, the voter um, that are necessary for them to cast a ballot privately and independently. Um, if, the if the polling location is not accessible, a voter with a disability can request curbside voting as an accommodation even if the location generally does not um, allow it. Okay, next slide. Um, so now we move on to uh, filing a ADA complaint with the Department of Justice. Um, you can file online um, by going to um, their rep website. The, um, you can remain anonymous um, and or you can uh, include your contact information 
um, if you want to, and it will only be used um, to respond to your submission. Um, you can also um, mail in using the ADA complaint form um, that is available on the website and the um, address to mail it to is below. And um, also there's another option of um, calling um, to use the uh, DOJ scribe if you are unable to write and unable to submit a complaint online by mail or flat or fax. So you could call um, one of the numbers uh, below in order to have someone on the other line um, scribe and um, you know write out your complaint. Next slide. So there are also um, protection and advocacy um, PNA agencies. Um, and they are a network um, that was created to provide legal representation and other advocacy services to um, people with disabilities. Um, there is a PNA agency in every state and territory and in um, the District of Columbia. Um, there's one serving in the uh, Native American community, community in the Four Corners region. You can find um, the PNA agency in your jurisdiction um, on the NDRN website. We have uh, the link um, on um, in the presentation on this slide. So you'll be able to access it there as well. Next slide, please. Um, so now um, discussing some uh, legislative efforts to make voting more accessible. Um, first, we have the Accessible Voting Act of 2024. Um, this uh, bill will establish new programs for ensuring voting accessibility, including um, creating a national resource center on voting access, on accessible voting and expanding the number of options for casting a ballot in federal elections. Um, as I mentioned previously, now we're getting back to it. Um, this is also the bill that um, I mentioned would change the name of the VAEHA -E um, to replace the word handicapped with individuals with disabilities. Um, and next we have the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2024. Um, and this act would restore the protections of the Voting Rights Act and strengthening uh, voting rights by expanding and strengthening the government's ability to respond to voting discrimination. Um, PVA supports both of these bills and will stay updated on how it's moving. Um, and well, that is. Um, and we go to the next slide. Okay. So I'll uh, turn it back to Lisa. Thank you so much, Antonia. So I had a question while we're waiting for uh, questions to come in, in terms of like a personal experience that I had. So I lived in both Washington State, um, and then later on I moved to Oklahoma. And one thing I noticed, Washington State, um, I'd just be able to mail in my absentee ballot, but when I went to Oklahoma, I realized I needed to not only have my ballot notarized, but the notary themselves can only notarize 25 ballots each, and then you have to find another notary. So um, to prevent that in the future, where would I be able to go to find out those provisions of a, the state I'm in, such as like if I'm moving? Great question, Lisa. So um, the US uh, Vote Foundation actually has a really great website. Um, where they have a state-specific resource guide um, that informs you of your rights as a voter, um, rights, at, rights for voters um, with disabilities, um, rules for assistance, um, even uh, contact information um, for who you should reach out to if you um, have a problem when voting and what accommodations are available. So um, their website is very thorough and it would have been able to um, like help you become aware of um, 
of that once you move or, ch or uh, change states. Um, so I would definitely recommend um, going to that website. It will be um, linked in um, the resources slide of this presentation um, to find out um, your state specific um, you know, law rules and laws um, when it comes to voting. So I would definitely re recommend that. It is very thorough. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have an, one question. Is, if I encounter a problem that day, um, what should I do on the day of voting? So um, if you um, ran into a problem that day, um, it would be best to um, talk to the um, election workers or the poll workers um, that are working that day and see if um, they could uh, do do something that would um, if like remove a barrier or um, like help you out in the way that you would need help. So that would be the thing that I recommend doing first, seeing if there is um, a solution, um, if a solution can be provided in the moment. Um, whether or not the solution is provided, um, you still have the option of filing the complaint, um, to, especially to the ADA. Um, even if the uh, specific complaint like doesn't get addressed or it is still all valuable data to have um, to understand what um, people with disabilities are experiencing um, when voting um, to potentially, you know, like help in the future. So, you know, just to wrap it up, first thing I would say to do is to, you know, see if a solution can be brought um, in the moment. And then I would say next to um, whether or not you want to, um, to file a complaint. And it doesn't have to be um, immediately after either. Thank you. Um, one second, I think we might have another one coming in. All right, I think that's about it. Um, and Anthony, you did mention um, some resources for us, um, as well as if anyone does have any other further questions or something that comes up after the fact, um, we, you can go ahead and reach out to her at AntoniaJ at pva.org. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and just go over a little bit the resources that you've mentioned a little bit so we can tell our viewers um, a little bit more about how to use those and what they entail. Right. Um, so some of the resources we have um, on the um, first link on the left, um, you can go to find more information on the um, ADA website um, about uh, their provisions um, in regards to uh, voting and polling places. Um, the link under that um, you could go to for the uh, PDF um, created by the DOJ um, on the federal laws protecting the rights of voters with disabilities. Um, you'll see all the laws that you saw today um, on this presentation a little bit more in depth. Um, the next is, um, like I mentioned earlier, the US Vote Foundation uh, website, their state-specific resource guide um, for voters with disabilities. The next is um, a um, roundup done by the Brennan Center um, that discusses the vote, all the voting laws um, enacted in 2023 um, and looks um, at how those will affect um, voting um, in 2024. So I mentioned that um, earlier as well. Um, and then next we have the VA website um, that gives more information um, specifically on how veterans um, can register to vote. Um, then next we have an EAC fact sheet on how the EAC empowers voters with disabilities. The next link, is, the next two links actually are from the EAC as well, um, discussing voter um, access, voting accessibility 
overall. And then the last one is also from the EAC um, for more information about accessible voter registration. Okay. And, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, no, and I was just saying, like uh, Lisa said, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, email me um, at AntoniaJ at PVA.org. <laughs> and I did have one quick question, I guess, that popped up right before we finish out. Um, it said, with the state by state website, you mentioned my state, Florida, which allows families to assist. Sorry, could um, you repeat that? Um, it says, would the website that uh, goes into more into state details about um, accessibility and resources and laws within that state, um, would it allow, um, would it go into if a family is allowed to assist? So I'm not certain what exactly um, the Florida um, resources say. I can definitely check it out um, beforehand and um, uh, let you know. Um, I'll be able to um, email you or you can email me. Um, and I will definitely check that out to let you know. Perfect. That is an excellent way to end the webinar today. So thank you so much, Antonia. What an amazing webinar to start out with, to welcome you to the team. Um, with that, if you have any questions, please feel free to email her. She's more than happy to help you out. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you have a great day. See you next time.